This morning's scripture lesson is Daniel 6, 10 through 13, and 16 through 22. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down, as usual, in his upstairs room. With its windows open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking God for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about the law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It is an official law of the Mendes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they, they told the king that the man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. So at Last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of the lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his royal seal and the seals of his nobles, so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and could not sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, Long live the king. My God sent his angels to shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. The word of God for people, for the people of God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Alan. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6 as we finish the last installment in our uh, sermon series that I've entitled, Darkness is No Obstacle, Holding On to God When the World Turns Upside Down. We've been going through the very familiar stories in the book of Daniel, and we've been applying those to our current situation. And what we've identified are these different tests, these different uh, difficulties that Satan often tries to put us through to get us to become discouraged, to get us to give up, to get us to walk away from God. And so we followed the story of Daniel and his three friends as they've gone through seemingly impossible circumstances. They're exiled from their homeland at a very young age and separated from their parents and their families and their traditions. And yet, in the midst of that, they stubbornly hold on to God. And because of that, God blesses them. Last week, we looked at the fifth test, which we call the popularity contest. And if you remember, Correctly, uh, Daniel went through uh, another difficult time. The king of uh, the Babylonians uh, had had another dream. Nebuchadnezzar had had another dream. And uh, this time he knew that Daniel was the go-to guy. And so he went to Daniel and he said, here's my dream. Tell me what it means. And Daniel was faced with a very difficult choice because he knew that the dream uh, foretold very bad, very difficult things for King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you remember the story, you know that the dream says that you're going to spend seven years where you lose your mind, essentially. You're going to be living out in the fields and eating grass like a wild animal until you acknowledge that the one true God is the true God of heaven and earth. And so we learned through this that there are three guidelines that we need to follow when we have difficult things that we have to say to other people. We learned that we have to ride the wave of anxiety, that we have to choose to speak the difficult truth, and then finally, 
that we have to always seek to be a trustworthy guide. Our one sentence sermon last week was that following Christ in dark times teaches us to approach life's difficult moments with the determination to honor God above all else. And so today we move into the final test, which is the integrity test. I wonder how many of you have ever had a feeling of, oh no, not this again. Anybody else? Yeah, exactly. If you've been alive at all the last few weeks as we've seen uh, testing numbers go up with COVID-19 and we've seen them start to talk about possible lockdowns again and things happening, uh, I've been having this feeling of, oh, not this again. I thought we were past this. I thought we had moved on. And it can be very discouraging. It can be very anxiety inducing. And as we pick up the story with Daniel, we actually see this oh no, not again phenomenon happening. You notice we skip from chapter 4 to chapter 6 in the book of Daniel if you've been following along. In chapter 4, they have a king, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. This is the guy that Daniel dealt with throughout his life. And in chapter 5, king Nebuchadnezzar dies and he's replaced by his son Belshazzar. And Belshazzar really isn't all that preoccupied with threatening everybody. Belshazzar just pretty much likes to party. And so Belshazzar is doing his thing. We have another very notable story where this invisible hand appears in the hall where they're having this party and it writes these words on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel parson, which means numbered, numbered, weighed, and measured. And so Daniel has to tell Belshazzar, the one true God has judged you and you have been found wanting. Uh, and so then what happens as a result of God's judgment is that the Babylonians are overthrown. The Medes and the Persians come in and they take over Babylon. And that would seem to be good news for Daniel and his friends because the Persians have this history of saying, hey, we'll conquer you as a people, but as long as you behave yourself, you can do your thing. You can be whoever you want to be. We don't really want any problems with you. So it should have been good news, but King Darius uh, of the Persians comes to inhabit the palace, and he's heard about Daniel, and he wants Daniel to stay and to serve him. And so uh, the people who are working with Darius don't like the fact that Daniel got to stay. And so they go to the king and they say, hey, we've got this great idea. How about, since you're so awesome, you make a law that says every time the trumpet sounds at noon, everybody has to bow down and worship this giant golden statue of you. And the king says, yeah, I kind of like that. And they say, but to make sure everybody does it, you need to add to the law that anybody who doesn't do this will be thrown into the lion's den. And so the king signs it into law. And part of the Persian culture was that once a king signed something into law, he could not change his mind. So once that happens, it's irrevocable. And so Daniel has this oh no moment again. Because if you remember with Nebuchadnezzar, he also made a law. He also said you have to bow down and worship this golden idol of me. And if you don't, you get thrown into the fiery furnace. And so rather than running away from this challenge, saying, Again, I'm not doing this again. I quit. I give up. We're going to see that Daniel takes a very different approach, the kind of approach that we would expect from him. It reminded me of a study that was done at Stanford University several years ago on willpower, on decision-making under stress. And here's what they did is they took a group of people who were already on a diet and they presented them with two options. They said, you can have this lovely bowl of fruit or you can have this great big savory hunk of chocolate cake. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm guessing which one you would choose if you could make that choice, right? Uh, but these people were on diets, and so they're supposed to choose the fruit. But then they broke people into other groups, and they gave uh, one group a list of four numbers that they had to remember. Four, yeah. No, it was two. I'm sorry, two numbers that they had to remember. And then they gave the second group a list of seven numbers that they had to remember. And they did this before they presented them with their options. So they said, uh, in 10 minutes after we finish this, you need to be able to recite for me either the two numbers that I gave you or the seven numbers that I gave you. And what they found was something uh, pretty interesting. Uh, the people who just had to remember two numbers, who were on a diet, remember, chose the fruit uh, about two-thirds of the time, 66% of the time. So most of those people did a pretty good job of sticking to their diet. The people who had to remember the seven numbers on the other hand, chose the fruit at a significantly lower number. Only about 35% of them chose the fruit. The rest of them gave in and they went with the chocolate. And so what the uh, people in the study concluded was that our willpower uh, is a part of our attention. And so the more attention we have to devote to other things, decision-making, 
thinking through processes, the more likely we are to make a bad decision. In other words, our integrity is very much based on habits that we put in place, decisions that we've already made ahead of time. This is why people do better on diets when they go ahead and prepare their food for the week on Sunday night or Monday night or whatever it is. The food's already made. They don't come home after a long day and go, oh, I'm really tired, I'm going to fix. Much easier just to call and get a pizza versus sitting out and eating something that's going to take me 30 minutes to put together. So if you have that decision made ahead of time, it's not such a problem. Uh, Jonah Lehrer, in writing about this experiment, says uh, that what it shows is that willpower is so weak and the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that's responsible for decision making, is so overtaxed that all it takes is five extra bits of information before the brain starts to give in to temptation. I don't know about you, but if I am faced between with a choice between uh, pretending to bow down and worship a king versus getting thrown into a den of lions, that decision is not very difficult for me to make, and yet Daniel makes a much better decision. Our foundational thought this morning is that holding on in dark times requires from us a willingness to place the past, the present, and the future in God's hands, rather than giving in to anxiety, rather than allowing ourselves to get all worked up and make a bad choice, we simply hand it over to God. Warren Wiersbe puts it this way. He says, if you take care of yourself and you walk with integrity, you may be confident that God will deal with those who sin against you. Above all, don't give birth to sin yourself, but rather pray for those who persecute you. God will one day turn your persecution into praise. And that's the hope that Daniel hangs on to this difficult time. So as we look at the question of how do I cope with these oh no, not again moments, we're going to see that there are three steps that are outlined in this story to building integrity. Number one, that we must get in position. Number two, that we learn to wait. And number three, that we choose to live out the gift. Our one sentence sermon this morning is that following Christ in dark times requires alignment with God's priorities, God's purposes, and God's timing. So we begin with getting in position. We're told in verse number 10 that when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, rather than panicking, rather than buying a plane ticket to somewhere a long way away, he instead did what he'd always done. Look at the wording here. He went home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. In other words, this was a familiar routine for him, and he stuck to it. Uh, if you're a football fan at all, you may remember a Hall of Fame wide receiver that played for the Indianapolis Colts, and I believe later the New England Patriots, late in his career by the name of Raymond Berry. Raymond Berry is in the Hall of Fame as one of the greatest wide receivers of all time, uh, but he was not the fastest, he was not the strongest, he was not the biggest. But the difference between Raymond Berry and everybody else who just had a career in the NFL was how much preparation he put in. Barry was legendary for arriving early at practice to warm up and to get ready for practice and then afterward he would get the backup quarterback or the backup to the backup quarterback or whoever he could get to stay and to throw him hundreds of routes and he would very precisely run the routes making sure he was using the exact number of steps and turning it just precisely the right time. But one of the things he was most famous for was uh, making sure that his hands were in the correct position. You can see uh, if you haven't played football, you haven't had to catch a football, it's intuitive to think that you just hold up your hands like this and you clamp them on the ball at the right time. But if you look at good receivers, especially those in the NFL, what you'll notice is when they turn, their hands are like this. It's set there to receive the point of the football through that diamond that you create between your thumb and your forefinger. And one of the most difficult things to do with young receivers is to get them to discipline themselves to turn and put their hands like this. Receivers who do that catch the ball significantly more often than those who do not because it's impossible, almost impossible, for the ball to go through your hands when it hits that diamond. Raymond Berry in his Hall of Fame speech for the NFL uh, said this, the most prepared are the most dedicated. In other words, those who make good habits and stick to those good habits are much more likely to succeed. Two habits that we see Daniel engaging in here. Uh, number one, we're told that he knelt down. The word here in the Hebrew, barak, means to salute, but it can also be a uh, mean to uh, 
be in position to receive something that is needed. It was a word picture of camels when they would bring them out of the desert to a watering hole. And in order to reach that watering hole, you can see in the picture what camels have to do. They have to uh, get down on their front knees. So they have to bend their knees and get down on them so that they can get their head low enough to reach the source of the water. They desperately need the water, but unless they put themselves in position to get it, it's not going to happen. So we're told that he puts himself in that position and then he prays. Uh, the Hebrew word selah means to bow, it means to curb or to limp, and it's a sign of weakness or submission. So we see two things happening here. Daniel acknowledges to God, I don't know what to do about this, but I know that you do. And so he puts himself in position to receive the answer to his need. You see, God's willingness to bless and deliver has to coincide with our readiness to receive those things, those blessings and that deliverance. I see this a lot of times in counseling as people will say, I want the answer and God won't give it to me. And what we almost always find is it's because that person hasn't put themselves in a position where they can receive that. They haven't agreed with God that this is wrong or this needs to change and that I'll do whatever you ask me to do. And so instead God waits until they're ready. We see this word used in Genesis chapter 24 uh, when uh, Jacob goes into the town and he says he made the camels kneel, he made them barak beside a well outside of town. It was evening and the women were coming out to draw the water. If the camel wants the water, he has to get in position. First key point is that if we're not receiving what God has promised, a good starting point is examining our daily attitudes and habits. What is it about my life that maybe is pulling me out of position? What is it about the way I'm living, the way I'm thinking, the way I'm speaking, the way I'm conducting myself that might be blocking God from doing what he needs to do in my life? Dallas Wheeler puts it this way. Uh, the general human failing is to want what is right and important, but at the same time not to commit to the kind of life that will produce it. We intend what is right, but we avoid the life that would make it a reality have to get in position. We have to be willing to shift our stance and change the focus of our lives. Number two, we have to learn to wait. So uh, Daniel prays. He does what he's supposed to and he gets in trouble for it. People see him praying uh, because in that culture praying was something that you did in a public setting generally. You had your windows open uh, so people could look in and they could see that Daniel was praying. So they turn him in and he's thrown into the lion's den and there seems to be no hope for him because they would keep these lions hungry. So if you threw a person in there, that person was going to get ripped to shreds. They were going to get eaten. And to make it even more hopeless, uh, we're told that they seal off any point of escape. Uh, the, the text tells us that the king sealed the stone with his own royal seal. So not only was this stone rolled over, but there was a wax seal placed over the opening so that nobody could rescue Daniel. The seal of the king and all of his nobles were on that stone. Nobody could rescue Daniel without the king's permission. That reminded me of another famous study uh, done in the 60s by Walter Mischel. And what he did was he was trying to test uh, self-discipline, uh, willpower in small children. And so he did something that today is known as the marshmallow test. Uh, because apparently back then marshmallows were a really big treat. I don't think it would work with kids today. But what he did was he would sit these little preschool age kids down and he would say, okay, I've got a deal for you slide a plate across to them that had a big fat marshmallow on it. He would say, you can have this one marshmallow right now. You are welcome to go ahead and eat it. But if you'll wait 15 minutes, I will give you two marshmallows. So do you want one marshmallow or do you want two? And of course, all the kids have one, two marshmallows. And so he says, great. I'm going to step out for 15 minutes. When I come back, if that marshmallow is still on the plate, you get two marshmallows. And then he videotaped what happened, and they have, uh, they have clips of this on YouTube that I show to my students when we talk about this, and it's hilarious. This is actually a still frame from that, and you can see the, the agony that these children went through, and some of them uh, had strategies that they used. One of them, I remember, turned his chair around backwards so he didn't have to look at the marshmallow, and others of them would get up and they would walk around the table, and they would sing, and they would do all kinds of things, but with most of the children, eventually, they would just kind of pick it up. They would hold it and see how it felt. And once they did that, it was game over because then they would they would smell it and they would just they'd lick it a little bit and then pretty soon they would just pinch off a little bit and put it in their mouth and hope that nobody would see. 
And usually by the time that Michelle came back in after 15 minutes, the marshmallow was gone. But there was a small percentage of the children who were able to wait, who were able to control themselves and receive their reward of double the number of marshmallows. And Michel followed these uh, children throughout the course of their life, and what he discovered was that they had significantly better, significantly more successful lives than the kids who ate the marshmallow who couldn't wait 15 minutes. These kids had better grades in school. They were significantly happier. They had less anxiety. And they had less depression. Uh, they got higher SAT scores. They went to better colleges. They were more likely to go on to graduate school. Uh, they had happier marriages, and they were less likely to divorce. Uh, Mitchell concluded from this study the following. He says, what we do and how well we control our attention shapes who and what we become, from our physical and our mental health to the quality and length of our lives. In other words, there are times when we just have to learn to wait. God's not a genie. God's not a cosmic vending machine. Sometimes God has to move the pieces around in order to bring the things we've been praying for, in order to bring the things that we've asked for. And sometimes God places us in a situation where all we can do is wait. We're waiting, but the question is, how do we wait? So Daniel is sealed up in the lion's den. The word here, katam, in Hebrew means to lock up. It means to seal off. I don't know if you are like me and you maybe have had seasons of your life where it feels like you're locked up. You have no choices. You have no options. You can't move out of this seemingly unbearable situation. And you question, where is God? Does God care? Is God going to do anything? We see this word used in the book of Esther as well, which also would have dealt with Persian kings. And, and we're told here that remember, whatever has already been written in the king's name and sealed or katam with his signet ring can never be revoked. So there's uh, hopelessness in that, but there's also a sense of hope because it depends on who is the king in your mind. Is it the earthly king who has sealed this with his signet ring, or is it our heavenly king who promises that he has our best interests at heart, that he will work all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. You see, things that are out of our control are not necessarily lost causes, but instead, God may merely be giving us an opportunity to build greater faith as we wait. Our second key point is that times of growth and maturity are usually confusing, they're never pleasant, but our part in them remains the same. The good news is we don't have to figure out all the details because God's already taken care of that. Our job remains waiting and listening. Reminds me of Psalm 27, 14. We're told, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. And then again, the psalmist says, wait for the Lord. Sometimes we have to learn to wait. Lastly, we have to live out the gift and amazing things happen. Daniel is thrown in to a den of hungry lions. He's left there all night. And when the stone is unsealed and it's rolled away, King Darius comes and he wants to know what has happened. And if you remember the story, he calls out and he says, Daniel, uh, has your God, the one true God, saved you? So God's accomplished, or purpose has been accomplished here. He's opened the king's eyes to who is in charge. And Daniel calls out and says, I'm fine, king. Uh, here's what happened. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me. Why? Because I have been found innocent in his sight. Uh, four or five, more like five years ago, uh, a best-selling book hit the market called Just Mercy. It's by a guy by the name of Brian Stevenson. Uh, he is a Harvard graduate, Harvard Law School graduate, who has devoted his life to trying to uh, get sentences overturned for people who have unjustly been placed on death row. And uh, he wrote this book called Just Mercy about these different cases, these different people that he worked with in seemingly hopeless circumstances. One of whom spent 30 years on death row before he was able to get him released. Uh, and there's some amazing stories, and, and Stevenson's dedication is uh, amazing. And he is very, very candid in the book uh, in talking about why he did this. Instead of doing what we would expect a Harvard Law School graduate to do, which is to go out and make a whole bunch of money, Stevenson worked for a nonprofit. He worked for very little money, working over and above the hours that one would normally expect. And he's done so for the last 30 years because of his belief in Jesus Christ and because of his belief in grace and in justice and in mercy. 
Uh, they just released a movie based on this last year. It stars uh, Jamie Foxx and Michael B. Jordan. It's, it just tells the story of one of those vignettes from within the book, but it's also a very powerful movie. But here's what Stevenson said uh, when he appeared before the Supreme Court and spoke to them about what he, his uh, organization called the Equal Justice Initiative. He says, when you experience mercy, you learn things that are hard to learn otherwise. Part of what he was saying was that, yes, these men had uh, benefited from the work he had done for them, but he had also grown. He had also grown closer to God, and he had also grown deeper in his faith because of the things that he had learned by extending mercy to others. Uh, Daniel uses a very interesting word here. He says that my God has found me innocent. The word here is zakah means that uh, it points to being clean, it points to being pure. It's somebody who is justified, who has been found not guilty. And then it can also mean translucent, somebody who the stains have been wiped clean and is just uh, perfectly see-through. You can see through from both sides. So in other words, what Daniel is saying is, I've been through this time of testing, I've been through this fire, and God has brought me out on the other side clean and pure and justified. How do we accomplish that ourselves? Uh, David answers this in Psalm 119. Uh, he asks the question, how can a young person stay on the path of sakah, of purity? And then he answers, by living according to your word, O God. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In other words, when questions arise, when choices arise, we immediately ask ourselves, what does God's word say? And what does it require of me? You see, God shows us mercy in the form of grace, not so that we can act as if we deserve it, as if we're better than everybody else, but instead so that we can change our hearts, so that we are compelled to pass it along. Grace is never intended to just land on a person and stay there, but instead it's supposed to be something that we pass along, that we extend to other people. It's a gift that is designed to keep on giving. So Daniel takes God's grace and he passes it to King Darius, <coughs> and offers him the opportunity to also worship the one true God. Our last key point is that some of our darkest hours may actually turn out to be God's greatest gifts to us. And that is because they fundamentally change who we are. If you've been through a difficult time, uh, you know that you can look back and say, I am not the same person I was before all of this happened. I am more humble. I am more forgiving. I am kinder. I am gentler. I think more deeply. I see other people with different eyes. And the hope for those of you who are still in the middle of a difficult time is that God promises that process is happening even now. Changed lives are intended to change the world. Brendan Manning puts it this way. He says, uh, trust clings to the belief that whatever happens in our lives is not random, it's not to make us miserable, but it is designed to teach us holiness. Three things to think about this week. Number one, ask yourself this, is real connection with God a habit in your life? When chaos happens, when troubles come, is your first impulse to cut and run, or is it to go to God, to kneel down and to ask God what to do? Number two, in what areas of your life is God asking you to wait and to listen? We don't like to hear these words, we don't like to be faced with this choice, but yet it's something that God very commonly asks us to do. And then finally, Ask yourself this, where is God asking you to pass grace along to others? God's given it to you, how is he asking you to pass it on to those around you? Let's pray. God, we thank you for these stories of Daniel. We thank you for his faithfulness. We thank you for your faithfulness to him and to us. God, most of all, we thank you that we are able to do these same things. As you place obstacles in our life, as you allow trials to come, we are able to grow, we're able to change, and we are able to impact the world around us. I pray that you would help us to be found faithful, that you would give us strength, that you would give us uh, the discipline to hang on to you in these difficult times. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when you come back next week, we are going to start a new series, a brand new series here. Uh, it's not a repeat. Uh, it is entitled True or False, Finding the Good News in John's Gospel. I'm going to be going through uh, the book of John, and we're going to be hearing uh, different truths about Jesus from the person who knew him best. Our foundational scripture will be John 8.32. You will know the truth, and the truth is what will set you free. You can see where we'll be going between...
next week and the first week of September. We're going to be looking at some very important truths that I hope you will find useful to you and that you'll also be able to pass to others. We'll be looking at the path to God, the way to heaven, the love of God, the key to happiness, the way through hard times, the antidote to fear. We'll talk about the question of control and we'll wrap up with the answer to doubt. So all of these are found in the Gospel of John. I leave you with this benediction from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Amen.